if we don't practice the skills when the stakes are almost nothing or super low, then we have no chance to, to implement that skill or that tool when there's actually something that is meaningful and on the line that matters. So if we don't build that muscle memory and that skill, when, you know, cause again, we're going to fail at it. It's going to be hard. We have to learn and practice, but in order to be able to use it when we need it, we have to do it when we don't. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Stable Cyclist Podcast. My name is JP, and today my friend John Shirky is in the house to share a lot of wisdom about mental performance and mental health. This episode is brought to you by Flow Formulas. If you are training for a race or you're just training to be healthy, you want to feel your best while you're doing it, and Flow Formulas Endurance Mix and Recovery Mixes are your answer. I'm a real heavy sweater, and so I always throw the high-sodium mix into my cart as well as the chocolate recovery mix. And if you've got a cart full of goodies too and you're ready to check out, you can go ahead and use the code JOHNPETER15 at checkout to get the discount that you're looking for. One more thing before we bring John into the studio. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, do me a favor and head over and please and thank you on giving us a five-star review. It helps the pod out greatly. All right, enough of all that. Time to bring in my friend, John Shirky. Well, John Shirky... You are not a professional mountain biker or bike rider. Um, You probably ride bike for fun, but you are a good guy to talk to about mental health stuff and about sports psychology. And you are a friend who I go to on these issues. Um, And so it felt like a really good fit to have you come on and talk with us about sport performance and mental health and counseling and a whole bunch of good stuff. And how are you, man? Dude, I'm good. It's good to see you. You're right. I'm not a competitive mountain biker. I don't even know if I would say I ride bike for fun. I do. The last year or so I have, I have a mountain bike. I have, you know, just like anything else, you got to have the right gear. So I've, I've gotten myself on track to hopefully, take advantage of it a little bit more this summer that would be awesome and you live in a great place to do it so usually i start things off with with our interviews and we kind of have a joke that we we go from like tell us about having never ridden a bike to the point that you're holding a pro license in your hands but obviously uh that doesn't really apply in this case so i think it would be better to talk about like how did you go from a kid growing up in minnesota who just wanted to play football to you're working in the mental health industry and now you're doing that and sport performance, like kind of what is the arc of how got it, how, how you got there? Because stories are such a huge part too of, of this business, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's, it's an incredible question and you're right. There is an arc and it, it follows a path where I wish I don't wish a lot of people, you know, it's like, Hey, I've always wanted to do this. I, I did grow up loving sports, everything, sports, any kind of ball, any com- competitive field. You know, if, if you want to play pool, we'll play pool. Pink doesn't matter. Right. I love competing. And so growing up in that environment, um, I guess has always drawn me to what helps people me be the best version of me in that. And then, and then as I got further down the road, I, you mentioned, I I played college football, um, at Bethel university after graduating from there, you know, and really, even when I was there, I, I was on the traditional upper Midwest. I'm going to be a social studies, history teacher and coach. Cause I, I knew I wanted to stay around athletics and competitiveness. And, and at that point that was, kind of the only thing that I knew was a possibility for me to stay involved. And I, and I did do that in some capacity where, um, but I learned that education wasn't going to be for me. I didn't want to sit in a classroom and and do those sorts of things. And so I started looking at what other areas of, uh, or careers where I could still work with people. Um, and then I came across social work. So social work is my background. And, and even within that, 
you know, I, I started out and I'm like, you know, I'm going to be a school social worker. Cause again, my, my mindset, my perspective was so limited to, I have to figure out how to get a job in a school to do this. And, and so as I continued down that road, I, you know, I, I vividly remember, and I actually just told my athletes, one of the athlete I'm working with right now, this story, because I just said, you know, at that moment, even still, I was, I was like, I never want to work in mental health. I don't want to work for a hospital system. I don't, you know, I, I had all these things that I didn't want to do. And it, you know, life and whether, you know, I, because I know you, you know, and I, I am a person of faith and I believe that things happen for a reason and obstacles are put in our way for a reason. And, as we continue to fight through muscle through figure out a way through um, it often doesn't go the path that we expected it to. And, and so even, even then I had all of these limitations that I had where it's like, no, I'm not doing any of these things. Well, the first job that I was able to get out of college was working in a school with kids with special needs, working in mental health. I already had, you know, already had taken a step down the direction that I said I never would. And, and from there, I just, I fell in love with it. I I loved working with kids being in the education system really intrigued me. Um, and then again, I, I just, it evolved from there to when we moved to Northern Minnesota and I was the director of a residential mental health facility for kids. And, you know, that my time there, I wouldn't trade for anything, Um, from the kids I got to work with and the people that I worked with. And, and all throughout this time, I had a parallel career where no matter where I was, what I was doing, you know, it was still really important to me to be involved in the competitive, you know, um, nature of things. And and so I coached all along the way and, and anything from, you know, basketball, football, golf, baseball. I, I mean, I, things that I, you know, didn't even have necessarily, what I would consider expertise in. And I loved it. And each of those offers a different opportunity. But the thing that I kept coming back to and really it crystallized for me when I ended up, my wife and I ended up in Colorado, I was the head football coach there. I had a private mental health practice and all of that time, I just, I, I wouldn't say I was intentionally fighting, you know, the overlap of those things, but I just didn't even, consider it. And I started to see a bunch of snow sports athletes coming into my office and the, the things that they were talking about in terms of the thoughts, the feelings, the, the emotions, the, the struggles they were dealing with were similar to what I was working with, with my football team on a daily basis. And that's when it kind of really, really clicked for me where it was like, you know what we can, and it's and it's useful depending on what the conversation is, but we we can call this mental health stuff and symptoms and all of these things, or we can call it sports and sports performance. But there's so much overlap that uh, once you once I got out of my own way, you know, it it really was like holy cow. The the two things that I love in terms of my purpose is to help people find their best in their life, and in athletics, and and when those two kind of came together that's really when i when i felt like i um really felt like i was in the right place and doing the right work so where do you where do you find yourself exactly today you're you live in montana yeah are you just doing sports performance or do you just do mental health or do you do some of both continually yeah do some of both continually um i have narrowed my focus to just because of the need um to, to working with, and I say working with athletes only, but that's, you know, all of us are athletes. So I, I I don't want to say, you know, you have to be on a competitive team for me to work with you or things like that. But I do really, I see the world from a competitive athletic mindset. And I believe that a lot of people that are competing still, whether that's recreationally or, you know, um, formally on a team, Ha, there's there's a need for the discussion around our mental health and mental skills and so it, it's funny it's i love the question and and you asked me and that 
to me, it doesn't even, I, I don't even separate them in my own brain really anymore. Um, mental health and, and sports performance because the skills, the things that we're working on are so much the same. It's just a different package. It's just yeah. a different language that we use. Um, so, so yes, I do a little bit of both. I work, um, I have a private practice. I contract with Montana state, um, exclusively with their football team, um, right now. And then I, yeah, I have a bunch of individual clients across the state and, and across the Midwest. Yeah. So, and this, I wasn't even planning to go here right away, but let's, let's go with this. When we talk about mental health, mental health, and then we also talk about sports performance or sports mental performance or however we want to say it. And, and we do recognize, and this is part of the reason I wanted to have you on you. And I think very similarly about these things, when you say there's all these crossovers, what kind of things are you working on with your athletes that you would also be working on with your, uh, you know, a person like me who walks in the door and like, I, like I have a legitimate bipolar, uh, bipolar diagnosis. That's a real mental health diagnosis that I need some skills built with. Are, are you talking about like things like cognitive behavioral therapy and those kind of ideas that kind of cross over into everything or what specifically when you say like, I see a lot of this running together in the same place. What are, what do you mean specifically, John? Yeah. And you, you brought it up. Cognitive behavioral therapy, I, I would say is the the foundation between that and more of a solution focused approach. Those are the two things that I draw from the most. And so cognitive behavioral therapy, again, it's funny because I don't, I don't use the word therapy much anymore because I think that, you know, there's, there's also, you start saying that and, and depending on the environment and, and who's around and what, what is needed, you know, people have a, an idea of what that means. Right. And so anyway, but the, the baseline of cognitive behavioral therapy, if for those of you who don't know and, and how I describe it to the athletes that I work with is, you know, anytime all day, every day, we have events and things that are happening to us around us. And those events lead to some sort of thinking or a story that we tell ourselves about that event of that happening, that interaction, that thought turns into a feeling. And then that feeling internally creates really what we're going to, how we're going to act, how we're going to behave, what we choose to do with that example. I always give driving down the road, somebody cuts me off. Now I have to stop at a red light. That's the event. The thought is, man, that person's a jerk. What did, you know, and then now I'm angry and now I'm yelling and I'm whatever I'm doing. But the reality is that thought is what created that whole cycle that may or may not be based in fact. And so you have to be able to recognize that, first of all, this is the pattern of how things happen. Second of all, you need to be able to be aware of and catch those thoughts and say, all right, is this fact or is it not? And then you can reframe <laughs> and choose a, choose an alternative, right? And And see what other opportunities or possibilities are out there. And so that's the super short version of that. Um, you know, when you talk about a crossover skill, you know, that's, that's all, all of our life is about the stories that we tell ourselves in our head and then how we feel and how, how we behave and act toward those things. And once, you know, for myself, once I started to realize that it was just like, man, I wish that I could give this to other people. And so that's, that's, I spend most of my time, um, on doing that. And then, and then also a solution focused perspective where it's like, Hey, Let's build on things that have worked in the past or that that may work rather than only focusing on kind of the deficits and what maybe you don't have as a skill set. Um, so we build those up in addition. And I want to I want to preface to everybody. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is amazing. It has worked wonders personally for me, but. Uh, in the case of a lot of, and, and I know John, you would back this up, but in the case of most, if not all major uh, mental health disorders, it's not the end all be all. Like it, it is a tool in my toolbox that I've, that is so valuable in helping me work through things. But I also have to take my meds and I also have to go to therapy on a regular basis. And I also have to exercise every day. And so sometimes people learn about 
cognitive behavioral therapy or it's sometimes called CBT. And they're just like, oh, you just need to do this. Like you just need to learn this set of skills and then you're going to be fine. And the reality for those of us that struggle with things like bipolar disorder um, and, and the list, you know, can go on uh, depression, anxiety, these crippling uh mental health disorders, we need a lot of tools in our toolbox, not just one. And so yeah. as John and I sit here and talk about this, I don't want you to hear like, oh, it's just this awesome way to rethink our day. And like, you can rethink your way out of anything because I, I do encounter those people in my day. And especially when I see them working with youth who are struggling with mental health, it drives me nuts to think like we can just think our way out of it. These are tools not to go on a rant, John, but take it no, away. No, no, you're absolutely right. And, and I think just like anything else, you know, and whether we're talking about mountain biking or teaching or playing football, you, you don't, you don't get to learn something once. And then you, that's just the be all end all of now. Oh yeah, cool. I can do that every time. Now I spend a lot of time to working with people, you know, we're so used to physical tools, physical skills, things that, you know, whether it's, you know, again, athletic forum or not, where we, we understand that we have to, there's a process to learn and to practice. And then we can ultimately, we build up our expertise in that. The same is, is true for mental health, you know, and whether we're talking about CBT or any of the other tools you have, it's a, it's a daily, sometimes hourly, sometimes by the minute journey of, getting back to what is the tool that I need for this job? Can't, do I have the reps that I need? Do I know how to do it? Have I practiced it? Can I execute it? And absolutely it's, it's, you, you can't use the same tool to fix the same problem. If you need a hammer and you have a screwdriver, it doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk about uh, one of the, you know, big misunderstood things or like the big mysterious things in the world. You do run a mental health practice. What the heck is counseling? Or what could we say is what is therapy? Because that I think is such a misunderstood topic. And it's one of the reasons I wanted you to come and be like, Hey, I'm an, I'm an expert. This is what I do. This is what it is. Oh, well, I, I mean, It's, that's, that's a funny question because I spend a lot of my time avoiding that stigma, that those words, just like I said a few minutes ago, because I, yeah. I don't want someone to have a preconceived notion. But I, I, I believe most people have this idea of therapy and counseling as I, I, I sit on a couch in a dark office with someone who's got a whole bookshelf full of books and is a pen and a paper. I tell them all my problems and then they say, Hey, here's how you fix it. And oftentimes that requires, Hey, tell me about your mom and all of your past and all of those things. And again, just like what we just got done talking about, those can be useful at times and those conversations and depending on what you're looking for, there's people out there that are still going to give you that. And, and some people do really, really well with that model. I work from a perspective of um, really it's, it's based on how, do, how can we communicate? I'm, my biggest question is you're the, you know, coming from a perspective of you are the expert of your life. I don't live your life. I don't know all the answers to your life, but I see my job and in, in my role as a counselor and as a therapist to listen and to ask enough questions to get you to think about things differently and maybe talk about things that you never have considered before. And, and most of the time it starts with what's not going well, what's not working for you in your life. And that's again, whether that's athletics or your life. And most people can say, well, I, you know what, I have a hard time with my kids or I'm having a hard time being motivated to go work out or I'm, you know, I just feel like I, I get to the weekend and I just want to sit and watch TV or whatever, whatever's going on. People can identify, you know, Hey, this isn't working for me. And then once we can identify, all right, what's, what's not 
working as well as you want it to, or, and sometimes it's not even broken. It's what do you want to improve? Right. And, and so once we can get to that point, you know, now we can start asking questions about like, what might be the cause of this? What are the barriers? What are the opportunities? And then we can, we can develop a plan around, okay, what do I, how do I want to see my life and what do I want it to look like versus me in a, a, what I think most people think as a therapy session saying, Hey, John, this is your, this is your future. This is, if you go do this, things will be just fine. That's not my job. Well, and to be honest, in your case, that would be terrifying because you're like six, six and you played <laughs> tight end or O-line in college and football and yep. you leaning into some tiny person saying, tell me about all your problems it might be a little scary, but yeah. What so is that like is that a typical if somebody comes to you and I know like you are one out of many mm-hmm. I know I know what my sessions are like they're more traditional like what you described that works for me yeah. but I know it doesn't work for a lot of people so in your mind like are we talking a normal uh session like being an hour is it a half hour kind of whatever the patient needs and then is that kind of that arc that you follow that you just described during that time no, and that's a great question too. And I think I think it's changing a little bit. And unfortunately, just like a lot of things in our our world, we we do things not because they're necessarily the best or the best model. We do things because of the financial structure of whatever it is that we're doing. Sure. So, I, and what I mean by that is, most often, you know, people who are accessing mental health services are using some, some form of insurance and insurance has said, you know, these are the parameters of what a session should look like, where it should be, how it should be conducted, all of those things. And, and those certainly there's value in, in some, some regulation in that. And, and insurance is a great thing. It's another tool, right. That allows people to access services that they might not access otherwise. Now, I am fortunate. So yes, I mean, typically you would think um, 45 or 60 minutes is kind of a standard traditional length. Um, I operate a little bit differently. I still certainly offer that. I'm fortunate enough to be in a situation where I I contract with a, with a team, you know, primarily that's my primary client is the team. And there isn't that regulation because they're, they're paying, they're just paying me. And the thing that I, you know, I like about this and and even in my practice outside of working with football, I really try to work with the individual to see what is, what is the sweet spot for that? Um, because I, the, the last thing that I need for myself and for, for my clients are, well, you know what, we got to 30 minutes, we did some really awesome stuff, but we got to get to 45 or 60 to make this worth while right and now we start adding things or we start trying to dig up things versus hey here's the focus of today we whether it's we process something and now we learn a new skill or how we're going to apply it or whatever but now we set a new focus and and especially with younger younger people i find that 45 minutes or 60 minutes is often way too long and so i i don't i don't even remember the question other than what length of (laughs) No, it's all good. It's all good. So I'm just trying to kind of establish for a baseline for people that maybe don't have any familiarity. I think of myself back in, you know, 2019, if you would have yeah. told me in 2019, like, Hey, you need to go do counseling or therapy. Like I, I literally laughed at people who told me that. And partly because I had no idea what it even was. And so I've always just sat and thought like, well, what if I could talk to a counselor and we could just talk about what it is, you know? Um, And one of the questions that I have for you too, is like, if somebody's going to be new with their counselor or new with a therapist, like you don't always know it's going to be a good fit. Um, I, I got lucky. I had a good fit immediately, but a lot of people aren't. And so when you're going into those, say you finally decide you do want to go get help when you're going into those first appointments, what kind of things should you be looking for and what should you be willing to ask of them to know if it's a good fit? 
fantastic question. And I, you know, one of the things that I, I offer to anyone who is even considering working with me is a 15 minute, no, no strings attached. Let's just, let's get on the phone or a video call. I want to introduce myself and who I am answer any kind of questions like this up front because I don't want you committing to, Oh, I have to go see this person and I don't even know anything about them. And it, it's gotten better because we have a lot of databases and websites that, you know, have a variety of people and people put their bios and here's, you know, here's the things that I'm interested in. You know, you get to learn a little bit about those people, but that's one of the things I would recommend absolutely is before you, consider going to, to meet someone. What, what do they, what do they say online? You know, what is, what are they about? Do they have a website and, and what is the language there? Is it speak to you? Do you, are, you know, I would recommend, you know, one, Google them, go to their website Two, check social media, see what, what are they putting out? What are they liking? What are they engaging with? And now You can't do that because there's a million options and there may not be a million available options. But I think asking questions about, you know, what, like you said, what can I expect from you? And if, and if the provider isn't already telling you that up front, Hey, here's what you can expect from me. Here's, you know, how I operate. Um, That's, that would be a, a, something to make a major red flag. I mean, so you got to be willing to ask that. Um. What other questions? I mean, I I think the other thing too is, I know this is going to sound funny, but like, where is their office and how is it set up? I don't, I actually got rid of my office several years ago and I don't even, and and which creates difficulty in, in a lot of things, but I also now meet with people and we go for a hike, right? We can still maintain confidentiality on a hike or out, you know, out in nature or, or sitting in a park. Um, but again, that's, that's one of the very first things that I tell people is here's who I am. Here's what you can expect from me. And here's why, if that's not a good fit for you, that's okay. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to think what else I, I mean, I, I do think it's important for you to beforehand think about it. Do you have, certain things, whether it's a faith-based counselor, if if you're a person of faith, if it's athletic minded, um, because I I do think whether the things that are important to you, um, oftentimes and are important, you know, if they're important to someone else, they have a different perspective than someone who maybe didn't grow up in athletics or didn't grow up in a, in a place of faith. Um, so those can be helpful to have some sort of common ground, at least again, to start with. But I think the, the other biggest thing is if it doesn't feel right immediately, it might not be. And so don't be afraid to, don't be afraid to try something else. And what's hard about that. And I, I hear myself saying that. And I also know because I, I have to turn down clients sometimes and say, I, you know, I don't, I don't have time to take on new clients right now. And I think that's, one of the frustrations I hear from a lot of people is like, well, how do I find somebody who's good and is taking new clients? And, but so my encouragement though, is it, you're better off if you're not comfortable and you can't trust the person and you don't feel like it's a good fit. It's not a, worth continuing because you're trying to find someone else and you can't find someone else right now. I would say, that yeah. makes sense. So I, yeah, I mean, no. just no, for sure. And and yeah. if people are sitting there thinking like, well, what if I need help sooner than later? Or my like, you know, the thing we always hear, oh, my brother needs help a lot right now. Well, the, the reality of our current medical system is it's going to still take time and you have time to think through these questions before you're going to probably have the opportunity to see someone. That's just the sad reality. And uh, I'm believe on on your podcast john i talked i have talked about how i got diagnosed on december 1st of 2020 and the first available and i got referred that day for uh therapy and counseling and the first available appointment was april 5th of 2021 and and i was like considered like fairly high need at the time and so Mm -hmm. i had a lot of chance to sit back and ask think about those kind of questions and 
think too what like I needed to get out of this or what I was looking, you know, to try and as much as I could tell at the time what I thought I needed to get out of therapy and counseling. And so you do have time to think through these things, even if you feel like we need the help now. Uh, the, the rest of the medical industry and the, the doctors and the psychiatrists will be able to get you the help you need in the immediacy until those spots open up. So, so I want to go back to one thing you were talking about earlier, and that is the way in which you conduct your sessions. Cause this has intrigued me for a long time, even before you didn't have an office I think this goes all the way back to the time in Northern Minnesota where you were working with the youth uh, and you were like, how did I end up working in mental health? But tell us about how you like, give us more detail. You said I go on hikes for a session with people or sit in a park. I've heard you talk about playing basketball or playing pool as a means to have a therapy session. I want to, this is where I want to know like story. Like, I want to know how did this come about and how did it happen? And yeah, take it away. No, well, a lot of it was based on the environment that I was, I was in. And I think it became a very comfortable and useful tool for me. Um, I, I, I started out, like I said, in the, in a school. So it was actually K through 12 kids that all were on in special education and needed also mental health support. And so they, half of their day was spent on education and in a classroom and the other half was spent, you know, working with a therapist or a counselor, um, on the mental side and, you know, mental health, mental skills, and really, you know, kind of what prompted me to go down this maybe non-traditional therapy style was I, I had gotten a yellow, yellow lab, retriever puppy um my one of my first years that I was working at the school and by necessity because I got her in the in, in the winter I, I brought her and my wife my wife was working so I, I had to I brought her with me and I just had her in my truck um and then I would go and take her out when I had breaks and and things like that when she was seven weeks old well my my boss at the time who was the director of the school she's like what do you what do you got going on? I saw you got this dog and, and I was like, well, I just, you know, I just got her. She's seven weeks. I'm starting to train her, you know? And she's like, just bring her inside, just bring her inside. And that was one of the coolest. And that totally changed my life for sure. Because at that point I was getting, I got a, a dog that I could hunt with, you know, and a companion and all these things. And it opened this door to almost immediately, see the impact that animals had on the kids certainly because it created this central focus for both of us in a room where it was on an animal you know and they were petting the animal and they were playing with the dog and and through the course of that we got to then i would ask questions about something and and it's it's almost like I mean, it's like listening to music while you do other things, right? There's a part of your brain that needs that stimulation to also unlock that creative, that creative and that communicative part of that. And so almost, like I said, almost immediately, I could see the impact it had on the kids that maybe weren't willing or able to to talk about things. And all of a sudden, because they're playing with a dog, it distracted them enough to create that opportunity and it created an opportunity for them to be safe because now I have this tiny puppy and, and it's not just me who's six foot six standing, staring at a kindergartner saying, Hey, tell me your problems. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. But, but also, you know, and, and at that time, depending on who, who I was working with, right. It's, you can make parallels to, Okay, this 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 animal has needs. We have to take it out. We have to feed it. We have to get it water, right? And so, when you start to connect that those those needs and the responsibilities for something that is outside of me, now I can see that. But if you want to talk to me about all the things that are, you know, that I have to do, you know, but they wanted to make sure the dog was okay, and so then 
through teaching them that sort of thing, now we can start to say, okay, and how does, how did then relate it back to them and, and what they could do to take care of themselves. Um, one of, one of my favorite stories, uh, from that time and, and it, it evolved from there, but one of my favorite stories from that time is I, I was working with a kid at the time he was 10 or 11 years old and he had been adopted from, um, a orphanage in, in, um, Eastern Europe. And because of his upbringing in that environment, you know, he didn't have a ton of social skills and he didn't understand social cues. And in his world, physical was the answer to everything, right? And earlier we were talking about tools. And if you have a hammer and you need a screwdriver, that doesn't work. Well, he basically was carrying a hammer around and he was going to force his way into everything. And in a lot of ways, he got attention because of that. And he got a lot, he had a lot of skills and he did a lot of things well because of that. Well, that didn't work with my seven week old puppy because it just created a fear. And this, this young man was not, I mean, he wasn't great, a great communicator, certainly not his feelings or his thoughts, but once he realized that the dog was scared of him hmm. because he just would run after her and try to catch her. And then she would run away. And through the course of teaching him how to approach her, he then got to learn, Oh, I can now approach people in a similar way because now people started to interact with him differently. And his only goal was to get the dog to like him. And it took, took a long time. Um, you know, several months, for her to be comfortable enough. And she, even still she was cautious and she'd go up to him and fast forward, you know, that, that young man since has graduated, you know, he's, he's got a job. He's, you know, he's doing awesome in, in terms of being a member of the community. And so that's kind of the start of it. And then when I moved to Northern Minnesota and I was in a, in the residential facility, those of you who have had any experience with that, you know, there's a wide range of needs and personalities and, you know, you, you have children coming to live in a, in a facility and we got to, I mean, entertain them is not the right, but there's gotta be entertainment. We have to keep them active because if we just yeah. do nothing. And so I had the dog then too. And then I also realized again, similarly where you find something that, somebody is interested in now there creates that connection, that comfort, that level of trust. If you're willing to do that with them, well, maybe I'm willing to, to talk a little bit about how I'm feeling or what's going on in my life. So I, I, you know, I, it's funny because I still have a coworker there and I, that would say I did my best work around a pool table, you know, because <laughs> Cause kids want, I mean, they wanted to play pool. And so we could, we could start a game and again, it distracted them enough to kind of let their guard down to trust, to share a little bit. And as that got more comfortable, it, it just became more and more, um, I, again, it's not for everybody, but, right. um, and that's, and that's where, like I said, going back to, you know, choosing someone you're going to work with. I tell people that up front and I say, look, I don't have an office. I, I'm going to meet you someplace where you feel comfortable. And whether that's a coffee shop or a park or taking a hike or wherever, um, that's, that's how I operate because that's how, that's how I relate to this. And if you're not comfortable with that, that is totally fine. Um, and some people aren't, but more often than not lately it's man that's pretty cool we can just go for a walk and yeah. we can talk yep is do you think some of that that shift in people being more willing to do that kind of work is or or that style of work is because of the stigma that is attached just in general with with mental health in our sadly still in our country of going to get therapy. I mean, I yeah. even think about, I, I even think about like the, I guess it's the hospital that I go to, but like the mental health wing is like tucked away, 
you know, and it's in a place so that, you know, you can kind of sneak in and out if you need to. And and I just have always looked at that and thought, this is so dumb that like, we need to do this, like, cause we're here to get help. And like, for me personally, it's really helpful help. But is, is that why people are opening up more to these other ways? Like what you are talking about? I, absolutely. I think so. I mean, cause just like using the word therapy or counseling, people have an idea of what that means. And, and you saw my reaction even when you said, well, I actually, I go to the hospital. Yeah. You know, most, most people don't want to be seen going to the hospital. Yeah. And whether that's, you know, the front door, the back door, the side door, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't even, you know, cause people make and people make assumptions about what that means. Well, it doesn't mean anything other than you're a human being, just like I'm a human being. Yeah. But a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. And, and you're right there. It's, it's more often than not tucked away, hidden, separate from other things. And I, I think that's one of my career ambitions and purposes really is to continue to chip away at the stigma of what, and, and the idea of what people think mental health and therapy is because it, it doesn't have to be this thing that is looked at and viewed in, as a negative. And I, and I think it, it is changing. And, but I also think that's why a lot of the online virtual platforms are, are doing really well is because there still is a stigma. And so, but wait, I can sit in my house or my office or my car and still get help. Well, that's great. Yeah. For a lot of people, but that doesn't work for everybody. For sure. My, my therapist told me that when they switched, uh, due to, due to COVID, they switched to fully online, that their attendance went to almost a hundred percent. And that since they've come back to like, you could do it in person, the attendance is like dipped again through their, through the whole client base. And I think that's just like an amazing parable of what the actual state of our country and the world is. Cause you, you know, you listen to podcasts from anywhere in the world, they're advertising the online therapy services because it, like you said, it's a way to work through it without feeling like you're getting judged. Mm-hmm. Well, How, and, and especially, no, go for it, go for it. well, I was just going to say, and especially you and I, uh, you know, have lived in still in some regards live in a small community. And so, you know, the, the, there's no anonymity when you're walking into the hospital, people know who you are, you know, and, and that's where, again, the online version of that is, um, it can be a good introduction to, and I, and I, it'd be a good introduction to having someone who is in a non-judgmental space that just can listen and that you can totally trust that, no one is no one. They don't know who you are or where you live or what grocery store you shop at, you know? So if, I, I think that's a really good option for, for a lot of people. We, so we've talked about athletes that you work with. Um, we've talked about people in my situation um, who go to get counseling and therapy. So me personally, I didn't believe I really needed it until somebody, fra- well, my sister, uh, who's a, a doctor phrased it to me in this way. She said, you need someone who will coach you on life because you aren't the best at that right now. And, uh, you know, as a, as a athlete myself, um, hearing those words that somebody needs to coach you in life made a lot more sense than just like, Oh, you're going to go sit in a chair and talk to somebody. Um, for the person that's sitting there and, and, and like, or you have a family member that you think might need some help. When is the point where you're like, yeah, therapy is probably a good idea. Is it any time? Is it something significant? Um, you know, like when do we hit the point where we're like, yeah, like we maybe need, we maybe need some work here, add some tools. So, I mean, the short answer is anytime, but that's, that's the easy button. Right. And, Unfortunately, I think most people still think, or maybe they don't even think once they find themselves in a situation where they're in a 
I'm not crisis. I'm gonna, you, crisis I'm gonna use mode. the word. I'm gonna use the word crisis, and but yeah. loosely, right? Where it's it can be a traumatic event, you know, at work or an accident or a a death or you know some major life event, and then people are like, oh, now I don't know what to do. I don't know how to think. I don't because in those times, our emotional state is just to the point where, like you said, I don't even know what the next step is. I need someone to kind of tell me, hey try this out. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, my encouragement, I guess, would be to, to do it not because you feel like you have to. And I think this is one of my goals as well is not because you think something is already totally broken that we have to put all the pieces back together, but there's always opportunity to figure out, okay, what, what can I improve? What can, what can be a little bit better? And so one of my favorite quotes is like, you don't have to be broken to get better, right? You don't, it's not about always fixing something that is totally in disrepair. It's about strengthening and building muscles and building skills so that the next time life throws you, you know, one of these situations, maybe it's not as intense. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe the response isn't as difficult for you or your family because you have some of those skills and those tools. And, you know, I was just talking to a client today and I said, you know, if we don't practice the skills when the stakes are almost nothing or super low, then we have no chance to, to implement that skill or that tool when there's actually something that is meaningful and on the line that matters. So if we don't build that muscle memory and that skill, when, you know, cause again, we're going to fail at it. It's going to be hard. We have to learn and practice, but in order to be able to use it when we need it, we have to do it when we don't. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's, it's the whole analogy of like practice when it's dark so you can be good under the bright lights. Um, right. And a lot, you know, and we do tend to think about everything in the in the whether it's mental performance or mental health sphere, um, but especially mental health, we think about it as like crisis management or like firefighting. And you look at when we're using so many of the same things in sports performance, but we're using them proactively. That is where we really need to start seeing the shift of of the benefits, because obviously you're not going to be able to to mitigate the crisis. Like the, I mean, we're still going to have crises in our lives, but, um, if we can manage them better, cause we're a little more prepared for it, um, that would be really positive. And that I, I'm a lot of that is this kind of stuff you're doing with the football team where mm -hmm. you're just trying to give them the tools. So when they, <laughs> when they do fumble at a game late, they don't have a total meltdown. My last question, John is, is just kind of one thing I've posed to a lot of people as we talk about mental health, there, there is a fear when we get in the positions where we are in that crisis, that if we ask for help, uh, you know, it's going to go sideways on us. And we, we don't always remember that the people around us really care for us. And so the, the question I've asked people is if, if you could look at that person in the eyes who's having that crisis, what would you tell them about, stepping out and asking for help well I, one of the things the first thing that comes when you were were leading into that question is you know we have this fear that things are going to go sideways if we ask for help my question would be to that person are things going the direction you want them to go now because if we can get to, i mean if you can honestly answer that question right that no, may, the, this isn't the direction I'm going. I'm already going sideways. I'm already going down a road where I don't, I'm in over my head. I don't know how to think or feel or act. And things are, you know, whether it's family or athletics or performance aren't going how I want them to go. Well, what do you have to lose, right? In terms of things are already not how you want them this could be something that helps. And so I think that that's, that's kind of my initial reaction to that. Um, and then I, I think the other thing too, is that 
we get so worried about what other people think of us. And, and I say we, because that's me included all, I mean, every day I feel myself going down a road or thinking, well, what does this person think? Or, or I'm, you know, I was, I was just walking on, on the college campus today because I was going to the bookstore to get something. And that thought, it just popped into my head. It's like, what, I'm 39 years old. What, what do these college kids they're looking at? Like, why is this 39 year old here? Old, right? old man. That's why is this old man? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> but that, that popped into my head, but yeah. of all of the, no one said anything. No one was like, Hey, yeah. what are you doing here? And the percentage, the percent chance that anyone actually cared or thought that, or it impacted their day in a meaningful way is almost zero. You know, and so it's like we worry so much about what other people think, but the reality is everyone is worried about what's going on in their own life and in their own head. And so if you're worried about asking for help because of what other people are going to think, one, they probably aren't thinking about it. And two, it might give them an opportunity to say, yeah, you know what? That's really cool. I might need that. Thanks. Thanks for being the person to say it's okay to not be okay. You know, because a lot of people are looking for that too. A lot of people are looking for someone to give them permission to not be okay. Yeah. Ooh, that's good stuff, man. That's good stuff. We've uh, we've had a lot of deep emotional encounters on podcasts, you and I. Uh, Jamie's not here today with us, but uh, <laughs> yeah. It's good stuff, man, and a good way to end it. And I appreciate you as a human being. We could have dove into a lot of other things um, and things we've experienced together, but this was a really good conversation today and needed, I think, for a lot of people just to have kind of a baseline of of uh, I unearthing some misunderstandings, I guess, about the mental health industry or, or the mental health world and how we can help people kind of get on the same footing and and get that help that, that they need and, uh, to stop moving sideways. So appreciate you, my man. My pleasure. Keep doing the work you're doing. It, it, it makes a huge impact and, and we don't always get that and we all, we need that reminder. So keep going, my man. John Shirky, everybody. Thanks for listening today. If you're looking for more content, you can head over to the Stable Cyclist YouTube channel where we have just finished releasing the Bankruptcy Bike Build series. And in this multi-episode series, we ripped the bike down to its bare frame and rebuilt it almost entirely with parts from companies in the bike industry that have gone bankrupt in the last year. All the while we were doing this, we were also having conversations about my own mental health story and my battle with bipolar disorder. You can also find me on Instagram at The Stable Cyclist. Finally, The Stable Cyclist podcast is a twice monthly show focusing on long form content that mainly talks about bikes, mentality, and when the situation is right like today, we focus heavily on mental health. Have an amazing day. Thank you for joining today. And most importantly, remember you are loved. <laughs>